Hollywood blockbusters, decadent parties, and super yachts. The Malaysian people were defrauded on an enormous scale. Billions of dollars stolen from Malaysia's sovereign wealth fund, 1MDB. 101 East lifts the curtain on the alleged corruption of the former Prime Minister Najib Razak and his wife Rosmar, and investigates how key institutions were rendered powerless as the nation's coffers were robbed. This is how I draw, a simple way. I start with his hair. This is, you know, and then face, okay, and then fingers. It's early 2015, and Malaysia's internationally celebrated cartoonist Zuna is delighting his fans with scathing sketches of the extravagance of the then prime minister and his wife. What should we have in fingers? Ring, ring. Huh? Ring, eh? Ring, ring. The matter here is how much you spend public money to buy a private jet? Yes. Or how much you spend public money for your hair? Here got another person. This is his hand. But it's a dangerous business. Zuna's out on bail on no less than nine criminal charges for his cartoons. All those here politicians, cartoonists, well, in prison. Like many others who dared to criticize the government at that time, he was branded an enemy of the state and faced the daunting prospect of 43 years behind bars. They banned my boo. Uh, they raided my office several times. They confiscated my rowing. Uh, they destroyed my exhibition and they imposed a travel ban on me. People keep asking, why don't you do a normal cartoon? I say, no, I need to do this. I need to expose corruption. And this is the risk I need to take. For me, I said, this is a duty. This is the duty of cartoonists. In May last year, Zuna was finally vindicated. I accept the verdict of the people. After being ruled for more than 60 years by the same party, Malaysians voted out Prime Minister Najib Razak and his repressive and corrupt government. When finally we achieved the victory from the people, of course I'm, I'm very happy. The, the, I, I couldn't sleep for two, night, two days, two nights, because they are so very, very happy to, to, to achieve that. Yeah. Zuna's work documents Najib's almost decade-long rule. Greed and the alleged billions of dollars stolen from the country's sovereign wealth fund, 1MDB, are a constant theme, as is the former Prime Minister's wife, Rosmar. She's the most powerful person in Malaysia. Yeah, I think there's no secret. There's no secret she's in power, but she's a godsend to me as a cartoonist because I can use her to open up people's eyes about corruption. So, of course, I, I need to thank her. So she said, see the, the steel wall. In Zuna's world, Star Wars becomes the steel wars. You see, this is the Mary Antoinette. She, she loved diamond. Yeah. Emilda Marcos loved shoes. Grace Mugabe loved handbag. But she loved all. Shoes, diamond and handbag. Everything. Everything. It's been a dramatic fall for the power couple. Banned from leaving the country, police raids on their family home seized almost $30 million in cash and more than $240 million worth of luxury goods and jewellery. The most expensive piece valued at $1.5 million. There were 284 boxes containing handbags and there were 72 bags containing cash, jewellery and watches. Mr Najib, yeah. very angelic. Yeah. Very nice to meet you. Pleased to meet you. Please yeah. take a seat. Thank you. In an exclusive interview with 101 East last October, the former Prime Minister claims none were ill-gotten gains. 
First of all, it included a lot of gifts from governments. There were, there were, there were gifts given uh, you know, by friends, including uh, our in-laws and so forth. You know, I had no intention of using some of the expensive gifts given to me by foreign governments. No intention. I wanted to keep them so that one day I'll put it in a museum. But his defence is dismissed by Malaysian businessman Deepak Jakishan, once a close friend and business associate of Rosmar. You know, she's just plain greedy. She wants it all. The diamonds, uh, especially the expensive, priceless pieces, they were her way of keeping the money. It was an easy way for her to siphon off uh, the money and to keep in a very simple place. They never imagined they would lose the election. They never imagined the police would raid their house. Deepak says local business people lavished Rosmar with jewellery in return for lucrative development contracts. I'm not the only one, there are many businessmen. Jewellers all over the world would come and visit her in the house every day. And if you have a certain transaction, a business transaction going on with Rosmar at that point, she would ask us to come to the house and she'll introduce us to this jeweler. She said, I've just bought this, not much, two million US. Can you please make sure he gets the money by Friday? So, so our job was to ensure that we send the money to the jeweler. Your own money? Yes, of course. It's a lot of money. Well, if you have a billion dollar deal with her, she's given you a major concession, what the hell? What's a few million between friends? You know what I mean? But most of the time he was in the house. And he says Najib was aware of the transactions. He is party to everything he knows. Sometimes he even comes and sees the pieces. He admires them. He looks a little bit shocked when they say it's three million US for this particular seven carat pink diamond, but he doesn't say don't buy it. Yeah. He's well aware of everything. And it wasn't just jewellery the businessman says he bought to ingratiate himself with the couple. I have given them substantial amount of cash, properties, cars, and all these were given to them either in Malaysia or in the UK. I uh, bought a Bentley Flying Spur for Datin Rosma and a house in Malaysia which was registered under the name of uh, Datuk Najib's brother, Datuk Nazim, as part of the gratification. He went from a friendly relationship. Eventually, Deepak says he found himself entwined in the couple's own business dealings. I became their proxy in various property dealings belonging to the government. I was tasked with purchasing the property and this property was then flipped in a couple of months to different institutions, organisations. Sometimes the irony is back to another government agency, of course, with a profit involved. Right. So they were purchasing these properties yes. and then reselling, reselling them it, yes. and making money out yes. of them. Yes. Datin Rosma is an astute businesswoman. It's not very difficult for her because her husband is the Prime Minister and any property that she has identified, it's always hers. It went to a point where every project had to go through her. Any cabinet minister who defied her or who dare voiced out against her was just axed off. You could say she's the de facto prime minister. And it seems from Deepak's account, Rosmar didn't even trust her husband. I was basically her confidant. And uh, there were many things that were asked by her to be done, including uh, taking documents from government offices and these documents were for her to counter check on her husband so that she knew exactly how many contracts were awarded that week. She wanted her stake of every single contract. It might not be as anticipated as the Harry Potter books, but the biography of Rosma Manso has been... According to Rosma's authorised biography, her very expensive collection of jewellery came courtesy of official guests. Sometimes late at night I lie awake and watch him sleep 
state governments and leading business figures not only spent up big on her biography, they also indulged her singing ambitions. This album co-sponsored by a subsidiary of the National Petroleum Company. But today, Rosmar faces 19 charges for money laundering and tax evasion, as well as soliciting more than $45 million in bribes for a government contract. But it's the world's biggest financial scandal that plagues her husband. Najib Razak faces more than 40 criminal charges, from money laundering to abuse of power the majority related to the alleged misappropriation of hundreds of millions of dollars from 1MDB. And questions are now being asked about the role his wife may have played. Rosmar's son from a previous marriage was a close friend of Jolo, the now fugitive Malaysian financier and alleged mastermind behind the $4.5 billion heist. Riza Aziz allegedly received almost $240 million of 1MDB money. This is the greatest company in the world! And according to the United States Department of Justice, used it to produce the Hollywood blockbuster Wolf of Wall Street and to buy tens of millions of dollars worth of real estate. Najib also got a, a, a kid with a different wife. But the one who benefit most it's Rosmah's son. Najib's son didn't get it. It's Rosmah's son is the one who got money. So we can say that, you know, even that from that also we know that she's, she's very, very powerful. Something that seemingly didn't go unnoticed by Jolo. Famous for lavish parties, private jets, and a $250 million super yacht, Jolo allegedly laundered more than $1 billion of 1MDB money, buying luxury real estate, famous artworks and jewellery, not only for supermodels, but also for Rosmar. The symbol of corruption is this diamond, this pink diamond from Jolo. The whereabouts of a pink diamond worth $27 million, which the United States Justice Department alleges Jolo bought for Rosmar, is unknown. But the former Prime Minister insists it was a gift from the brother of the Crown Prince of the United Arab Emirates. But your wife met with Jolo, the jeweller. She knew it was a gift from him. No, 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 no. Jolo presented this as a gift from Shea Manso. OK? Uh, there's a culture in the Middle East that uh, expensive presents uh, are given. He's a master liar. He's lied about every single matter. The murder case of Alton Tuya Once again, Deepak dismisses the former Prime Minister's defence but this time goes on to accuse him of lying about something even more sinister than corruption, covering up a murder. I never, never met her at all. He lied that he never met Altan Tuya. Altan Tuya Sharabu was a young Mongolian translator. In 2006, she was shot dead on the outskirts of Kuala Lumpur, then blown to smithereens with military-grade explosives. Najib was then defence minister, and she'd had an affair with his close confidant and advisor. Two ministerial bodyguards were convicted of her murder, but no motive was ever established. The bomb they used, yeah? This bomb only can be accessed in the uh, Ministry of Defence. Those two who, who killed Mongolian lady said openly in court that they didn't know her. There's no motive. The question is not about who killed them. The more important question is who gave instruction for those, those, this guy who don't even know the victim. The cover, you see, this is Altantuya. This is the submarine. Alton Tuya is suspected of being murdered because she wanted $500,000 promised from an allegedly corrupt submarine deal. The deal was signed off on by Najib Razak. This involved uh, 111 uh, million euro corruption as a kickback. 
but it's a very sensitive issue in Malaysia during that time. That, that was decided and still the... is for the former Prime Minister. There's no shred of evidence. I am totally, totally innocent of the Al Tantuya case. Absolutely. He's never been charged over the murder, but the big question is, why did he allegedly try to pervert the course of justice? In 2009, a private investigator who was one of the last to see Alton Tuya alive came forward with a statutory declaration implicating Najib in her murder. He scrambled when the first statutory declaration was issued and sent his brother in the date of night to meet the person who had issued and signed the first SD to reverse and revise the SD so that it doesn't show his involvement in the case. There is no reason for him to do that if he was not involved in the murder. Deepak says Najib and Rosmar directed him to take the private investigator, known as Bala, to meet Najib's younger brother, Nazim. According to Deepak, threats were made against Bala and his family, leaving him no choice but to change his statutory declaration to clear Najib. The next morning, Bala and his family were escorted out of the country. Datu Nazim had given him money when he left. It was part of the arrangement to facilitate him leaving Malaysia enough money for him to leave. Deepak says Najib then got him and others to facilitate payments to Bala overseas. There was even a deputy minister involved in coordinating uh, payments to Bala whenever he would want something. Why did your brother get involved with um, forcing Bala to change his statutory Bala declaration? Bala was making a lie. Um, he was we... making a wild allegation, baseless allegation. But he'd so written I don't think a statutory we want to go declaration saying as as she'd had an affair with I you, nothing... that you'd introduced her Come on, to your defence, and you. that she was owed money. She was promised from a corrupt oh my God, submarine I have, deal. I have no knowledge of her. I have not met her. You can ask me about Bella died suddenly of a heart attack in 2013. His wife launched legal action against Rosmar, Najib and his brothers, and Deepak for loss of income during the time her family was forced to live overseas. By this time, Deepak had severed ties with Rosmar and Najib, but the court case thrust him back into their web, and he says he was forced to use their lawyer and file false defence statements exonerating them. I've been literally held at ransom by Najib and his emissaries, not to testify against him, not to give testimony, not to give, not to sign affidavits against him in court. Every time I terminated their lawyer, they would bring up a matter and say, we're taking action against you. The income tax department is winding you up right now. The bank is calling on a loan Deepak claims one of Najib's emissaries went to extraordinary lengths to make sure he'd never take the stand. He says, I tell you what, my friend is a doctor. He's going to say that you're very sick. He's going to say that you need to be admitted and you cannot attend the cross-examination uh, coming Friday. The businessman says Najib's lawyer, Shafi Abdullah, then got involved. Shafi is defending Najib against the 1MDB charges and has himself been charged with four counts of money laundering and tax evasion. I was in the ward. They came up with a medical report. The Tansri Shafi didn't like the medical report. He edited it. He instructed the doctor to change it and that medical report was served to the court. You go overseas for treatment. And finally came Deepak's Bala moment. He was told to leave the country. Exactly the same situation. I say, how long am I going to go overseas? No, 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 no. Go now. One day after the court case, you come back. I had to go, I didn't have a choice. Take his destruction or be destroyed. 
I'm a businessman. I've got liabilities. I've got assets. I cannot afford this. Najib, his brother Nazim, his wife Rosma, and lawyer Shafi have not responded to 101 East regarding the allegations made by Deepak in this program. But Bala's wife has commenced contempt proceedings against Shafi, and Deepak has lodged a police report documenting what he alleges happened to him, and is suing Najib and Rosma for millions he says he's owed from cancelled contracts. They destroyed me financially. There was no way anybody could go against them. And it seems that was the case when it came to the alleged stealing of 1MDB funds. From 2009 to 2014, hundreds of millions of dollars of 1MDB money allegedly flowed in and out of the then Prime Minister Najib Razak's personal bank account. No, no, no. He that, claims he believed the transfers were donations happy. from the Saudi royal family. I even informed the Central Bank of Malaysia, but there was no um, indication uh, there was any concern. In fact, Bank Negara approved uh, the funds that came in and approved the funds that went back out. So I assume everything was fine. But the Attorney General at the time had a different view. In July 2015, just as he was reportedly preparing to charge Najib over crimes related to the misappropriation of 1MDB funds, he was removed from the position. The amount of power the Prime Minister had to be able to, to uh, dismiss uh, uh, an Attorney General uh, at, uh, at will uh, it led to this situation. Lawyer Lim Chi Wee was on the review panel of Malaysia's Anti-Corruption Committee, or MACC. He says the new Attorney General, Najib appointed, refused to cooperate with international investigations into the laundering of 1MDB funds. The new AG, uh, despite uh, repeated requests by MACC, uh, did not issue mutual legal assistance requests to foreign jurisdictions. His excuse uh, was that there was ongoing police investigations in Malaysia. Uh, as a lawyer, I, I certainly don't subscribe to that excuse. Uh, what would you, you say to people some... who say that you put that Attorney General there so that you could control him, so that you could cover up the corruption that was happening no, within 1MDB? I, I reject that totally because I'm on record. I've made um, many statements to say that anyone uh, who's done some wrongdoing uh, will be held accountable. No one is above the law. We urged the then Attorney General to look at the investigation papers in a professional manner and, and do what is right. And what would have been right? Uh, well, as now things have uh, transpired, the right thing to do would be actually uh, uh, to prosecute. Lim Chi Wee says members of the review panel came under enormous pressure when they called for a probe into the Prime Minister's bank account. I understand phone calls were made. Some amount of persuasion would have been applied through the phone calls. And I guess it was the power of the Prime Minister that was coming to bear on your review panel. Yes, one, one can say that, yes. At the end of our term, uh, none of us had our term extended and uh, this is to be contrasted to the then Attorney General uh, going public to say that uh, the then Prime Minister Najib did not commit any wrongdoing. The then Attorney General didn't respond to 101 East on these matters. I think we have to learn a lesson from what has happened in the past and that is concentration of power can create an abuse of power and I think it's rather ironic uh, that Tun Dr. Mahathir, uh, currently our seventh Prime Minister, is seeking to restore, revive institutional checks and balances, which he, as our fourth Prime Minister, has been criticised uh, for weakening in the past. When Mahathir came the first time, early 80s, then he changed the valuation system where people, value, people started to value money after that. It's no more about your principle, it's no more about work ethic, it's no more about credibility, it's no more. Back in his studio, Zuna continues the fight. He believes if Malaysia is to avoid another corruption scandal, it needs a culture revolution.
when it comes to corruption in Malaysia, corruption in Malaysia is up to billion. You see how many countries will allow corrupt to be billion? Don't blame politicians 100% when they are corrupt in Malaysia. You have to blame the people. Why you allow him to corrupt so much? In Malaysia, people are very happy. You corrupt, I can get benefit from it. This is the character that destroy Malaysia. That is why even even though now we got a new government, the mentality is still there. The mentality. Yeah? But it's a mentality not exclusive to Malaysia. As the country's justice system prosecutes Najib and Rosmar and a handful of their inner circle, the international banking system and regulatory authorities must also take responsibility for the role they played in the world's biggest heist.